here's another video that y'all requested and asked me to remake and you know i i had done this video maybe about three or four years ago on the channel but the video was only two minutes and 46 seconds long <laughs> wow i must have i was all shy to get on the mic then man i didn't know what i was really doing but now let's let's really get into this story right we're gonna get deep into the life of singer maxi who the world knows as Charmaine Maxwell from the female R&B group Brownstone. Now, I love some Brownstone. Always thought they were a great vocal trio. Plus, in the earlier days, man, I remember seeing them. They all, you know what? All the girls used to dress the same back in the day, like they from the hood. SWV with the baggy clothes, J, TLC, all of them. Brownstone too. But I must say, though, this is probably one of the craziest stories that I have ever heard. Crazy. Charmaine's death. This is a crazy story. But with that being said, now, Brownstone, right? Great group. Great R&B group. All the members. I love all the members. Tisha Brown, uh, Kena Cosper. But I love the original lineup. Charmaine Maxwell, better known as Maxie, Nicole Gilbert, better known as Nikki, and Monica Doby, better known as Mimi. And with their voices combined, it was like, their voices combined, right? It was like a powerhouse of soul and gospel church mixed together or something. I can't even explain it. They sound like a full church choir, but there's only three of them. Wow. It's power in their voices, man. Because see, Nikki, Nikki had that gospel type voice. Mimi could hit those high notes because she came from the jazz music background. And and Maxie, she was shy, but she had a soulful voice. And she could do it all. High notes, jazz, gospel, all of that. Because see, look, Maxie, Maxie was born in Guyana, South America. And by the time she became a teenager, she moved to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career and to be a singer. And when she got to L.A., it was rough. And, you know, trying to make it in the entertainment business during that time, it wasn't easy. Going to all those auditions all the time and won't get no jobs. But see, she never gave up, though. Maxie never gave up and she continued to go to the auditions and she started noticing that she kept seeing these two girls at the auditions that she was going to all the time and they was all kind of competing against each other singing but you know the two girls they was Nikki Gilbert and Mimi now see Nikki Gilbert was from Detroit and she had came to Los Angeles to make make it as a singer too and Mimi was from New Orleans and she was pursuing the same dream. But at that time, they was all just struggling solo artists trying to get in the music industry. After meeting each other in the auditions, right, and admiring each other's singing skills, that's when Nikki came with the idea that they should come together and form a group. And once they started singing and blending their voices together, plus the chemistry was good, they realized they had something special. Now, after that, they needed a name. And they decided to go with the name Brownstone because brown is the earth and stone is solid. Maxie said in an interview that the name represents the different skin tones of the group and the fact that they were all strong women and they were like stones because stones are unbreakable. Now, after that, right, and once they became a trio and a group, they started performing anywhere that would let them sing and people wanted to hear them, but it was still a struggle. They were still trying to get a record deal. Now, see, Maxie, right? Maxie was a beautiful, tall, brown-skinned woman that looked like a model. And one day, some guys, they wanted her to be in a music video, but everything didn't go as planned. They never made it to the video shoot. Some crazy mess had happened where Nikki ended up stranded in the desert or something Something crazy happened. Nikki said in an interview you can check out on YouTube. But anyway, the next day, right, 
those same guys that left them stranded in the desert, or whatever, those same guys wanted to make it up to them and ended up introducing them to some big time music publishers. But the music publishers weren't interested after hearing them sing. They didn't believe in their voices, or whatever. Disappointed, right? So Maxi, Nikki, and Mimi, right? As they're walking out of the audition, they're walking out. Two white women outside were listening to the whole audition and asked them, was that them singing? Because they thought they sound great and they wanted to help them. So look, the next day, those ladies at that audition, those ladies took them to meet a guy named Jerry Greenberg, who at the time was the president of Michael Jackson's new label called MJJ Records, which was a joint venture through Sony Records. But see, when they first met Jerry Greenberg, right, they didn't know that he worked for Michael Jackson. And when they auditioned for Jerry Greenberg, he instantly, he fell right in love with their voices. And he wanted to sign, he wanted to sign them. And he wanted them to sing again, though, at one of his conferences because he wanted them to meet someone special. So weeks later, at his conference, Brownstone sung again, but this time where they sung at, <laughs> it was a real dark room, almost pitch black with bright lights just shining on them. And when they finished singing, that's when Michael Jackson walked out from behind the curtains. Wow, that's crazy. And look, he loved their sound. Michael, Michael told them that their sound was extraordinary and he wanted them to be the first artist signed to his record label can you imagine though man everybody turning you down not trying to sign you and then the king of pop himself michael jackson ends up signing you to his label that's crazy the dream come true man they say uh the acapella song that they did and got them signed was if you love me lyrics wow man that's crazy to get signed to michael uh, Jackson man I think at that time Michael had just got with Lisa Marie Presley but uh, anyway now right now with a record deal they started working on songs for their debut uh, album and around that time there was a lot of girl groups that was doing their thing like I said earlier Change of Faces SWV J Escape TLC etc Brownstone was ready they were ready to take over the game they was hungry and Michael Jackson was an executive producer for the album, but it wasn't like it wasn't like he was in the studio every day with them, but he did have input on the album. I think Michael at that time, Michael had put out the history, past, present, and future double album thing, whatever. He had the song screen with Janet Jackson out. Now, also around that time, right, Maxie. Maxie ended up meeting her future husband, Carlston Soul Shock who was a music producer hired to work on their debut album. Now, Carsten Soul Shock, right? He was a white Danish producer that was part of a duo called Soul Shock and Carlin. And he did music for a lot of people, man. His catalog, look, Soul Shock, he did Whitney Houston's Heartbreak Hotel, Tupac's Me Against the World, and Do For Love, Ushers, You Got It Bad. He did Tony Braxton's I Love Me Some Him. Brandy and Wanye Morris, Broken Hearted. He did Monica's Before You Walk Out of My Life. I thought, I always thought Dallas Austin did that. Fantasia uh, song, True Fizz, Backstreet Boys, Pitbull, Chris Brown. A lot of people he worked with, right? This guy has... Soul Shock put in a lot of work over the years. Make sure y'all check his production out. Check his catalog out. And he was a judge later on. Later on, he was a judge on the X Factor, the Denmark version. But anyway, right, Maxi and Soul Shock fell in love. And they ended up getting married. And on August 11th, 1994, Brownstone released their first single titled Past the Eleven. <laughs> I remember that song. I like that song because Nicki... Nikki Gilbert spent a little rap in that song too. But see, it was the second single though. 
the second single off this album from the bottom up. This one took them to another level. If You Love Me, which was released on October 24th, 1994. Man, that was my joint right there. Nikki Gilbert with that powerful voice. And when Maxie was hitting them high notes in that, it was over. Now, that song would be their biggest hit of their career, hitting number eight on both the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and the U.K. Singles Chart, as well as number two on Billboard Hot R&B Singles Chart. It also topped the New Zealand Singles Chart for five weeks and reached the top 20 in Australia, France, Ireland, and the Netherlands. Wow. Plus, it was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal in 1996. But you know who the 1996, you know who they lost to. The song Creek by TLC. That's the same Grammys where TLC went up there and told the world <laughs> they was broke and had no money. That's crazy. But anyway, the song If You If You Love Me did earn five Billboard Music Award nominations winning one for top hot R&B single, Airplay. The song was big, y'all. That song helped their debut album, From the Bottom Up, become certified platinum. Not to mention, years later, way later down the line, it was sampled by rapper Tory Lanez and became a big hit for him. They was big at that time. Man. I remember seeing them on the cover of Jet Magazine and everything. Now, the third single, titled Grapevine, was dope too. And it, it did pretty good on the charts, reaching number 49 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 Singles Chart, number 6 on the U.S. Hot R&B Singles Chart, and number 16 on the U.K. Singles Chart. Now, Maxie Wright, she really showed her vocals on the fourth single titled I Can't Tell You Why, which was a remake, a cover song, by the rock group Eagles. And they did that because somebody from the label asked them to do a cover for that song and came out beautiful, man. Beautiful song. Now, after that, Brownstone was in demand. Everybody wanted to see them. And they ended up joining um, Boys to Men on a sold out US tour. They was doing shows with Patti LaBelle, Anita Baker, Frankie Beverly and Mays. Blackstreet was hot at that time. They did shows with them. Man, they was in Japan, Australia. They was everywhere. They were featured on the song Freedom, too, from the Panther uh, movie soundtrack. But you see, here's the thing, though. The album was successful, but the girls started having some issues with each other. Nikki and Maxie was cool, but Mimi had some issues. And there really wasn't, like, beef, but Mimi just decided that the music business just wasn't for her. And she had some health issues too. She had bronchitis real bad. So she ended up leaving the group and she became a school teacher. After that, they added a new member named Keena Cosper to the group. And on June 23rd, 1997, they released their second and final studio album titled Still Climbing with the single Five Miles to Empty, which I thought that was a good song too, Five Miles to Empty. That's a nice song too. And the song, it did pretty good. It reached number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 6 on the Billboard Hot R&B Singles Chart, pushing the album to certified gold. And they went out to promote the album on a European tour. Then they joined Keith Sweat for a bunch of concerts in the United States. But, you know, overall, the album, it... It wasn't as big as the first album. It just didn't make a lot of noise because lack of promotion from the label. The label didn't really promote it. That's why the album sales were low. Because if you go back, go back and listen to that album. Listen to it. It really was a great album for 1997, man. That was a good album. A lot of good music came out that year, 1997. And that album, Still Climbing, was one of them. Even though the album didn't do good, a lot of people still respected them and their talent in the industry. And in 1998, they had a song on the Players Club soundtrack called 
Don't Play Me Wrong. Um, they had a song on the movie, the movie The Woo, Woo soundtrack called Searching for Love. And they had a song called Party Over Here on the Trippin' movie soundtrack. After that second album, the group split up and went their separate ways. And they all started doing music on their own. And Maxi, Maxi started working on her demo to pursue her solo career. Now, a bunch of labels wanted to sign her, but they wanted her to still do the same music she was she was known for with Brownstone, but she wasn't interested in that. She didn't want to do that type of music anymore. I mean, she still did she still did R and B, but she wanted to do something different, like rock, pop, alternative, other type of genres, because she was a multi talented vocalist, man. She can she she was dope and she ended up taking a record deal with Mercury Records, which led to her moving to London. Now her solo debut single titled When I Look Into Your Eyes did pretty good over in the UK. And it hit number one, they say, over there in the UK. It did pretty good. But her second single was called uh This Is Where I Wanna Be. That ain't make no noise on the charts at all. And overall though, she did have success on her solo album. She had some success. After that, though, years later, everybody in the group, they just continued to do albums, solo albums, do other stuff. And they ended up getting back together. They did some tours. They're still doing shows. Then they settled down. They had kids. And they just lived their life. I know Maxie and Soul Shock had a son together. And they just fell back and spent time raising their family. I know Nikki Gilbert became a business entrepreneur, man. She was doing her thing in the TV and the movies, and she executive produced the show R&B Divas and a bunch of other stuff. And in 2015, Nikki, Nikki had brought an idea to Maxie about a show she wanted to do, which was about women who once had success, but then lost it all in the public eye, just like them. And she wanted to name the show the same name of their first album titled From the Bottom Up. And Maxie loved the idea. And she loved the idea and told her it was a good idea. And that's when Nikki took it to Queens Latifah's camp. And the show got the green light on BET. But see, but while putting the show together, that's when the tragedy struck. Because on February 28th, 2015, Charmaine Maxwell died after having a freak accident in Los Angeles at her house. Now, the story goes right. Now, let's get into this story because this is a crazy story. Now, the story goes right. On that day, which I believe was a Saturday, right? She had just came from her son's soccer game. And after the game, she went home and started drinking she was drinking some wine next thing you know they say she slipped backwards out of a doorway between the house and the back patio while holding a glass of wine and the glass of wine fell and shattered first on the floor leaving pieces of broken glass everywhere right and as she was falling, she landed exactly right on the broken glass. The glass had shattered on the ground, right? Right behind her head. And she landed right on it. Shaking my head, man. That's terrible. Wow. They say the broken glass cut and pierced her neck as her body hit the floor. Wow. Shards of glass punctured the back of her neck in two places. Mm, 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 mm. Now, hours later, right, her husband and her son came home from the soccer game, and that's when they found her bleeding and not unconscious. And that's when her husband's soul shock called 911. And the paramedics arrived and on the way to the hospital, though, she had she lost too much blood from her wounds that was so deep on her neck. 
that it was just too late to save her. And she died, man. It's crazy. Now, once her death was announced to the media, a lot of people questioned if her death was an accident or foul play was involved. And some media outlets even began reporting that she was suffering from depression and committed suicide. But Maxie's brother, Brandon Maxwell, denied the rumors that his sister's death was a suicide, saying in a tweet, People are so dumb. This is actually BS. That's what he put out in the tweet. He said, People are so dumb. This is actually BS. And he also had a link. I guess he had a link to that site that said that she uh was depressed and committed suicide or something but plus you know plus the police they investigated and claimed that she just fell and the glass shattered on the floor and the shreds of glass punctured the back of her neck in two different places she also had an injury on the back of her head so she was probably left unconscious as she bled. Plus, there was no history of domestic violence between them, uh, her and her husband. So they confirmed that there was no foul play and her death was just, they just said her death was a freak accident. Wow, it's terrible, man. And they were supposed to do an autopsy for the official cause of death, but I couldn't find that in the research nowhere, man. I researched for the all times. I couldn't find it. Now, Nikki Gilbert said she's putting out a book. She got a book. She says done. She's just going over it, going over it. But Nikki Gilbert says she's putting out a book, which is coming soon. And that's why she don't really speak on Maxie's death because she's putting everything in the book. So stay tuned. So. Let's see what she said about the whole thing. Maybe she can um, shed some light about her death because they was best friends and they talked all the time. That's crazy, man. Charmaine Maxwell was 46 years old. Rest in peace. Charmaine Maxie Maxwell. <laughs>